Hey, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first episode of Dota 101. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have no idea what you're in for, so basically, let me give you a brief rundown. What we're going to try to do today is go over very basic stuff, and that's really the goal of this series, is I want to teach players who are new to Dota, maybe they played, maybe you've played League of Legends before, maybe you've played Heroes of New Earth, maybe you haven't ever played a game like a MOBA at all. Uh, this is your opportunity to learn the basics, and... It should be an interactive thing, so if I'm teaching something and you don't understand it, well, that's where you can ask questions in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. I'm also very much open to making changes to the format. So as you're watching, if you have feedback, please keep it in mind, write it down, and then let me know. Uh, the best way to reach me is to just mention something on my Facebook, which is facebook.com slash LDDota. So that's basically what I'm hoping for. This is a very much a pilot, a work in progress, but with that being said, I hope you all will find it valuable, and uh, hopefully you'll learn something. So before we get down to the nitty gritty with the Dota, uh, I will just show you guys two things that happened to me today. Or actually one of them happened a, a day or two ago. And Well, you can see sort of the behind the scenes action for me. Uh, the first one is the following. <laughs> so, all right, so I'm on a new workout routine and part of what I do is I try to make like a big batch of chicken every day. Uh, I try to make like enough chicken to last me a couple of days. Uh, and sometimes it'll be another meat, like a you know, salmon or ground beef, whatever it might be. So I throw a bunch of them onto my George Foreman grill. And by the way, George Foreman grill, probably the greatest thing ever invented by, by humanity. Just such a, a useful tool, minimal cleanup. I, I actually, I, I don't work for them, I swear. But uh, yeah, probably my best $50 I've ever spent. So I throw like a pack of chicken on there. I get it all ready to go. Then I come back to start working on the show. And well, let me just say I got a little carried away with PowerPoint. And the next thing you know, these are not cookies, guys. This is chicken. This is what happened to it. So uh, <laughs> uh, let me just say, uh, it's good to set a timer. Maybe don't have your headphones on when you're doing something like this. Fortunately, uh, it's, a, it's a grill, so it didn't smoke too badly. Uh, I could have set the house on fire. All right, so that was the first thing that happened to me today. And Well, let me just say, I hope it's not an omen for the show, because if it is, then we might be in for a little bit of trouble. But uh, <laughs> the other thing that happened to me recently, pretty funny story, actually. I went to the gym. Uh, and like I said, I've been, you know, been on a new diet, trying to you know, get into a good workout routine. I've put on some weight the past couple of years. And let me just say, I know a lot of you are probably in high school or college, and you eat whatever the fuck you want. Trust me, I did too back then. Uh, but, well, let me just say, some of us genetics not so cut as others. And if you don't eat well, if you don't exercise well, start to pack the pads on. So anyway, I go to the gym. And at my gym, they, get, they hand out towels when you walk in, if you want one, you know, to wipe the sweat off and, of the machines and that sort of thing. And avoid being a totally disgusting mess. So I walk up, I, I show the guy my key card because they electronically scan you in, and he swipes it, and then he asks me, hey man, do you want to talk? And I lean forward to him, and I'm like, do I look like I need to talk? Is there something wrong with me? Do I look depressed? I mean, I was not in a bad mood, I was feeling pretty good. Uh, so I lean in closer, and I say, oh sorry, I didn't hear you, what'd you say? And I, I hear again, hey, do you want to talk? And I'm like, well, what is wrong with me? I don't, there's no problem here. I, I, do I look like I have a problem? Am I messed up? So I'm feeling like very bizarre at this point. And I'm like, oh, sorry, I really, I'm trying to understand. He had a bit of an accent. Please explain to me. <laughs> what are you asking me? And finally, I hear him correctly. He's saying, hey, do you want to tell? So, <laughs> uh, you know, I really need to get better with the accents because I'm going to be casting at the International in a couple of months. And actually, it's only a month at this, month and a half at this point. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot heavier accents than this guy. His English was good. Well, I mean, so anyway, that's sort of two lighthearted stories to, to break things up. Uh, at the beginning of every episode, we're going to do the following, which is basically review what happened in the previous episode. If you missed it, if you want to check it out, you'll have that option. So yesterday we had our first episode of Trivia Night. It was myself and Luminous hosting it and Lumi doing most of the heavy lifting and me just sort of there to make some obnoxious jokes and generally be... <laughs> You're telling the story, you are bizarre. Yeah, uh, what could I say? Um... You know, I'm just sort of there to troll and flame and that sort of thing. Uh, but we had some very special guests. Reaver Zai made an appearance. If you're from Reddit, I'm sure you're familiar with him. Uh, and of course, everybody knows Toby Wan Kenobi. He made an appearance as well on the show. And then we had a lot of uh, great contestants. I, one guy in particular, God, his name is escaping me. Answered probably the hardest question. Oh, oh you know what it was? It was, what's, what was the one hero that was not played at the International 2? Uh, or excuse me, at the International 1. And I, I could not have told you that. I watched every single match. So... Uh, yeah, anyway, I was very impressed by him. Uh, it was a lot of fun. If you want to check out that VOD, go just head over to Lumi's Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Luminous Inverse, or uh, go over to our blip.tv account, and that's going to have VODs for everything, and that's the dotashow.blip.tv. 
Uh, that won't that won't just have Lumi's content. It won't just have mine. It'll have both of them. So if you want to get anything, that is the one-stop destination. Uh, it'll also be available on his YouTube, which is youtubecom slash Inverse. All right. So enough sort of background introduction. Let's get right into the nitty gritty. Uh, my first topic and the the topic that we chose today uh, is hero selection. And to me, it was the logical place to start. If you're a new player and you join a game, no matter what the mode is, whether it's well, I guess if it's all random, then you're not pick a hero. But aside from that, you're going to be having some options, whether it's single draft, whether it's random draft, whether it's all pick, whatever the mode is, pretty much you're going to have to make a hero selection. And so that's really the place to start when you're trying to learn about Dota. If you pick the wrong hero, it's possible to win the game, especially in the pub scene. Uh, but it can be a lot more difficult. So we're going to begin where Dota begins, which is with hero selection. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into hero selection, and I just want to say up front, by no means is this comprehensive. You can't learn everything there is to know about hero selection in an hour. If you could, well, let me just say there would be a lot more pros out there, and you wouldn't see very many teams stay at the top for a long time. Uh, it but in order to be able to pick heroes well, you do need to have a basic understanding of hero roles. Uh, every hero has a role. There's a lot of crossover. Uh, but for our purposes, we're going to try and keep things simple, and I'm going to try and make it easy for you guys to understand hero roles. Uh, so with all that being said, let's jump right into the snazzy little PowerPoint I put together for y'all. Okay, so traditionally in your RPGs, you have your strength heroes, your agility heroes, uh, and your intelligence heroes. And when I say, of course in RPGs, it's not always that iconic class, but you, know, you have sort of your, your beefy, like melee, you know, tanky type characters. You have your damage dealers, you know, the rogue in Diablo, for example. And you have your, your wizards or... Uh, your intelligence type characters, and traditionally they, they have very clear roles. Uh, I hope you guys will enjoy the pictures, by the way. I'll try to spice these up a little bit for you. But uh, in I RPGs, like the, the roles are normally very set in stone. If you're a tank, that's what you do, and you don't really cross over. If you're a strength hero, uh, that's what you do. You just get in the front lines, you soak up damage, you try and deal it out. In the world of Dota, it's just not that simple. And so what I want to say to you guys is, forget about this shit. It's not that easy. There's not... There are strength heroes, agility heroes, and intelligence heroes. And these, these are important characteristics. I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't care at all about these stats. But when you're trying to sort of group heroes, when you're trying to understand them, don't obsess over that. Strength, intelligence, and uh, agility are misleading ways to group heroes. Uh, for example, there are strength heroes who need to sit in the back lines, Urshager being an example. Unless you're Sing Sing, uh, in which case you just... You got Lothars and Phase Boots, and then of Daedalus, and you go auto-attack everything to death. But generally, Urshager sits in the back lines. If you're, there are agility heroes who are very aggressive and tanky and difficult to bring down. Ursa, of course, being a, a perfect example of that. Uh, now, there are intelligence heroes that scale really well into the late game, uh, like a Storm Spirit or an Obsidian Outworld Destroyer. Obsidian Destroyer being his Dota 1 name. Uh, so rather than grouping these heroes in by their primary stat, it's more useful to think about them in terms of roles. And that's how we're going to talk about heroes today, is hero roles. So I, I already mentioned this is not comprehensive, so if you're, if you're expecting comprehensive, well, get ready to not just watch this, but then probably spend about a thousand hours playing Dota, and then maybe you'll start to have a, a deep grasp of things. It is, it's very difficult to become a master at Dota, but you can quickly learn the basics and get into it. So I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just saying, don't walk away from this expecting to know everything, but what you will get is a couple tools and a basic framework to work with. Also, quick note, this is not supposed to cover competitive drafting. Uh, if you're interested in competitive drafting, I say go watch Cinder and stream. Go watch Sing Sing stream if he ever streams uh, his team's scrims or uh, practice matches again. Watch competitive players, and then particularly watch the matches. That's the best way to learn competitive drafting. This is about the average pub player who may or may not have friends on his team. Okay, so all the qualifiers aside, let's get into it. So we have three different roles that I'm going to use for our purposes here today. The first of them... Uh, oh, yeah, and here we go. Uh, don't obsess over these categories. Uh, again, it's a way to group them, but... Uh, we're going to have carries. That's the first main group. And I have three, uh, you know, sort of, again, ton in cheek images here for you. Uh, carries get their name because with enough levels in farm, they should literally be able to put, throw the team on their shoulders and carry them on their back to victory. That's where the name originates from. Uh, but it's also a bit of a double-edged term because if you think about it, uh, a carry hero is generally not very strong in the early game. So carry heroes not only can carry their team in the late game, but generally they need to be carried in the early game to be really effective in order to get to that point. They need help at the start, and then they reward your investment later on. That's generally how the carry hero operates. Uh, and if you're a glory hound, if you're an egotistical bastard like myself, you'll probably want to play the carry hero. This will be your role of choice in most games. Okay, so when you pick a carry, you're going to generally be spending a large portion of the early game, last hitting creeps, and farming. 
Uh, this is because carries generally make better use of gold, which is why we have our large, beautiful image here of gold. Uh, and again, this, uh, this graph here, this is supposed to you know, indicate that, well, the carry hero scales well. So the more resources you get, levels as well as farm, uh, the, the more powerful you get relatively uh, compared to other heroes. And of course, if you're carry hero, you can never have enough. Uh, and sometimes there's, you just can't put your arms around all those creeps, or in this case, the basketball. So there's your images. <laughs> um, okay, so with that being said, let's talk about farming a little bit and what the benefits of farming can be. So our first example, we're going to have a couple of these uh, for today, is an anti-mage. This is a level 25 anti-mage up against a level 25 crystal mate. I gave the crystal mate a lot of items, and we're going to see what happens when these two interact. Anti-mage is a carry hero. Crystal maiden is a support. So again, this is a simulation, but here we go. Anti-mage charges in, he gets silenced, he uses Manta to stun it. He uses an Abyssal Blade, which is this item right here, to stun the Crystal Maiden. And you can see she doesn't take any damage. That Crystal Maiden, let's actually go back and just look at it again uh, when I clicked on her real quick. She's got a lot of items. She's got a, a Scythe of Vice, she's got a Shiva, she's got a Heart, she's got Ives Gaty, she's got an Orc and Malevolence. If you're not familiar with Dota, this is a pretty much a max inventory for an Intelligence Hero, which is Crystal Maiden. And it doesn't matter. Anti-Mage still chews her up. That's because he's a carry hero. He's a hard carry. He really scales well with the items. Yeah, this is a... You will, you will almost never see a CM this big. It is a very fat CM. It's also a very unrealistic CM. She's, she's small and petite for a reason, guys. She can't carry all those items. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> that's sort of our first point about the, uh, about the carries, is that when they get the items, they're great. They're unstoppable, or virtually so. Carry heroes, although they benefit a lot from items, they also rely more on them to be effective. Uh, so they're generally not going to be as powerful as other heroes in the early stages of the game. Because if they were, then why would, any, why would anyone not play a carry hero? So that's going to bring us to our second example here. And this is the Shadow Demon versus a Spectre. The Shadow Demon you see over here, that's our support hero. And he's got very basic items. Uh, all he's got, in fact, is a pair of boots and a TP scroll. And then here's our Spectre. Uh, it's a level 3 Spectre, I believe, and he's a, a carry hero, but a hero that needs a lot of items to be effective. So watch what's going to happen now. Uh, this is just a, you know, a simulated engagement, but definitely something you can see in the lane. It's Disruption to start, which is going to make two illusions of Spectre, and then Soul Catcher, which amplifies all the damage Spectre is getting. This Spectre is just running for his life, by the way, and look at how quickly he drops. Already losing two-thirds of his health, then tagging the creeps as well. He's not going to die here, and generally you're not going to kill him by yourself as a hero like Shadow Demon, especially not early on. But this is how powerful support is. This support, the Shadow Demon, he's got no items. All he's got are boots. They don't make him stronger at all. But his skill set makes him very powerful at the early stages. And in fact, some supports scale well into the late game. Their abilities do. But generally, they're not going to be able to deal a lot of damage. They're not going to be able to survive very long. That's what really differentiates them. So, with all that being said, everything is relative. There is a spectrum for all of the hero roles, including the carries. So every hero has his own point in the game where he peaks. Uh, the, you have hard carries, and then you have your harder carries, uh, and then you have the hardest carries. And well, let me just say there's a lot of debate over that. I'm not going to stick my neck out there today, uh, but we're going to go to another example. So here we have a Juggernaut, who is a, a he he has some ability to carry in the late game, but he is very strong early on as far as the carries go. Even from level one, Juggernaut can get a lot of kills with Blade Fury. It does a ton of damage. I don't know the number offhand, but it's just about enough with another nuke, uh, even at level 1, to secure kills. And then uh, when the mid game hits, he's still very powerful. But as the game goes later and later and later, he does start to drop off. But let's take a look at when both of these heroes are level 7, how they're going to perform. Juggernaut level 7 charges in, uh, and he immediately uses Omni Slash. And actually, you're going to see here, uh, if you're not sure what's happening, Phantom Lancer used his... He used an ability that he has, uh, it's called Doppelwalk. It makes him go invisible, it creates another illusion of himself. And Omni Slash just randomly does damage to one target at a time for a certain number of times. Uh, in this case, it's, it's three at level one. So Juggernaut didn't even get all his slashes on the main hero. If you watch here, he actually hits the illusion a couple of times. So this is not even a good engagement for the Juggernaut. And look what's going to happen now anyway. Uh, we're going to see the, the Phantom Lancer try and fight. He realizes he can't. He starts to run. And the Blade Fury continues to tick him down. I use the drum charts to chase. And Phantom Lancer realizes he's dead meat. And in the end, he goes down. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a Phantom Lancer who had about the same amount of inventory. He's a similar level. It just goes to show you, some carries are very strong at different stages of the game. Phantom Lancer is a hero. If you can get a max inventory, he will outcarry a Juggernaut. That's just how the hero works. That ability is called Doppelwalk, by the way. 
Uh, for, for, I see some people are asking in the chat. At Omni Slash was the ultimate of the Juggernaut. Uh, I could actually go back and show you guys that again. Uh, I might not be able to answer all the questions in the chat, by the way, because I want to try and keep things moving. But if you have questions afterwards, I'll be around to answer them. Okay, so we're going to see. I use Dust right here. This reveals invisible units. Uh, and then I use the ultimate. You see how he's bouncing around? That's Omni Slash. Now the Phantom Lancer, he's invisible, but I see him because of the dust. That's why there's this little blue thing above his head. And now I use Blade Fury, which does damage in an area around the Juggernaut. As long as you're close enough. You know, if that sword's hitting you, pretty much, you're doing the damage. And then I finish him off with a couple of auto attacks. I'm not running ads, by the way, so if you're getting them, I do apologize. Uh, but that's not on my end. Okay, so... This is a level 7 Juggernaut and a level 7 Phantom Lancer. Let's see what happens uh, when we look at a, another hard carry, in this case a Phantom Assassin, who's level 25 and the Juggernaut is level 25 as well. Phantom Assassin is one of the hardest carries in the game. She has built-in evasion. She also has an ultimate that gives her a, a, a chance to do, a percentage chance to do a 400% damage crit, which, for anyone who doesn't know, is a massive fucking crit. It's a lot of damage. So Juggernaut, again, max inventory here. Uh, a lot. These are very expensive items. They both have an inventory full of very expensive items. They can't really have anything else. You see the Omni Slash going off now. It does a lot of damage. And then Phantom Assassin just goes to work. She bashes him. She blinks in. She has an ability. Her blink strike makes her attack faster. Juggernaut right here is dropping Healy Ward, which helps heal him. And you see the Phantom Assassin killing that off. Uh, and this is a great pushing skill. Not so good in these 1v1 engagements, not so good for doing that late game damage. Uh, so the Phantom Assassin continuing to just rack up the bashes, and you can see Juggernaut's really not doing anything. Uh, for anyone who missed those numbers, let me just go back and show you. See that 1512? That's a, a 1500 damage crit. That's how powerful the Phantom Assassin is late game. Just melts right through the Juggernaut. And we saw how good Juggernaut can be early on, but he's not the hardest carry. So the point here is, Carries peak at different times in the game. Okay, so let's sort of jump back here. Uh, okay, I'm actually not at the supports yet. All right, so uh, everything is relative. There's a spectrum for all the hero roles, uh, and I went over that. Uh, one of the major factor factors that affects when the carry heroes peak is how quickly they can farm. Certain heroes like Syllabear, or also known as the Lone Druid, and Lycanthrope, these heroes are very powerful, not because they scale the best with a max inventory, Theoretically, they're not the strongest heroes. Well, Syllabary, Lodron, you could argue is, but that's another tale for another day. Uh, but these heroes are strong because they farm quickly, and they, they have abilities that really hit hard in the mid-game. Uh, so it all goes back to that peak ability. One of the factors is how fast can you get your items? Not just how much will the items help you, but how fast can you get them? So I've been trying a lot of 1v1 scenarios here. But ultimately, Dota is a, a 5v5 team game. And although carries will generally be the strongest heroes on the map, it's a team game. You're not always going to win by yourself. Supports still matter even once their period of dominance has passed. So let's look at another example that's going to demonstrate that for us. So now we're going to see a 2v1 situation. It's that Phantom Lancer we saw before. And again, this hero, when he gets that max inventory, pretty unstoppable. He's gonna, we're going to see in a second a lot of big items on him. Meanwhile, the Juggernaut, again, he is very big for this purpose. We're going to say he's maxed out. Uh, and let's see what happens here. So Juggernaut is going to go in and start the fight. And I'm showing the items now for anyone to see them. This is, a, this is a Shadow Salmon with some basic support items. A Disable item, an Initiation item called a Blink, which lets you move forward. Uh, and then and some Disable abilities, which we're going to see. That's really the key to this fight. So keep an eye on what happens once the Shadow Shaman jumps in. This guy right here. So the Juggernaut's going to start in. He's going to make a go here at the Phantom Lancer. Uses the Manta style. That's how we get these illusions. And you can see Wicked's actually doing okay. He's getting very unlucky here. Phantom Lancer has a chance to make an illusion every time. Uh, Wicked being the Phantom Lancer. He has a chance to make an illusion every time he attacks. He hasn't made any yet. That normally doesn't happen. But he's taking a decent amount of damage here. And then look at the Shadow Shaman disabling him. And in a split second, he's gone. So let's look at that again. He's pretty healthy. He's pretty healthy. Shadow Shaman blinks in. And if you can see here, I wish I could zoom in, but this is a video. Uh, this is a little, he's turned into a chicken. So he actually can't do anything. He can't attack. He doesn't have any evasion, even though he's a butterfly, because when you're a chicken, it removes that. He's very easily brought down. And with the Shadow Shaman here to assist, a fight that the Juggernaut might otherwise lose now becomes a fight that he can't lose because of the help of that support. So again, we're going to watch what happens. 
He just gets melted down in a few seconds. This is what I'm trying to point out. You might not be the hardest carry in the game, but that's really not all that matters. It's nice to be a hard carry, but ultimately, you're generally going to need your team. You'll see players like Dendi and Sing Sing and you know, the, the top pros, if you've watched any competitive games, they'll play pubs, and sometimes they can carry in that 1v5 situation with a bunch of useless teammates, but there's a lot of times where they can't. Yeah, and for every game that they win and play brilliantly, there's another game where their team just is too much dead weight. And that's the beauty of Dota. It really is a team game. Even in the, even in the public games, it's not just a team game in matches. It's a team game in matchmaking as well. Okay, so we have talked a lot about carry heroes, and that's just one of the categories. The next category we have are the supports. Now, the support is a very giving character, and that's why we have a present here. A nice little girl offering a present to her best friend. Uh, Shadow Shaman, I just showed him. Shadow Demon as well. These are a few examples of the supports. Uh, along with that, the support generally... Uh, go. We'll talk more about how these other two sort of fit in uh, in a second. But you saw right there, teamwork very important uh, in order to help your carries do their job. And that's why we're seeing some very cute ducklings distracting this nice young lady while this, this nasty duck just goes into her... <laughs> pocketbook and start stealing her money not sure what he's gonna do with it to be perfectly honest but you know it's teamwork that's what it's all about with the support heroes so when you pick a support your job is to create space and opportunity for the carries to get golden experience to a lesser extent you have the same responsibility or obligation to the rest of the team but it's the carries who need your help the most they are very weak early on we saw that specter if you go back to that clip and think about it uh, he lost almost two-thirds of his health just to a single support harassing him. If there was another hero there, he would have been dead. And we're going to show that right now. That as early on, the support can really make a big difference. Uh, and let's go right into that example. Okay, so we have... Here we have a Spectre. Again, this is that hard carry we talked about earlier. And a Huskar. Huskar is a hero that does a lot of damage early on. If you haven't ever played against Huskar before... He's a hero that can just, you, you generally can't 1v1 him in the early stages of the game. There's almost no heroes that can. There's a few, but very few. Generally, especially a hero like Spectre, is just going to melt if he tries to fight this Huskar 101. So, again, Huskar, Spectre. And then we have the wild card here, the Crystal Maiden. That's the support hero. That's the one you want to keep your eyes on. So, again, Spectre, uh, the, the Huskar having very basic items, but he does have a few more. Generally what you would expect in the early stages of the game, the Huskar is going to get ahead in terms of items, especially in a pub game. So here we go. Huskar charges in. He's going to start doing a lot of damage here to the Spectre. Spectre's health is going to start to drop very rapidly. You can see he's losing health a lot more quickly here than the Huskar. And then the tides are going to turn because the support's going to come in. One nuke to start, and then another to follow. First she slows him with a big AoE, uh, and then she holds him in place. And now he can't actually do anything. Uh, he's going to start to take damage. He's going to be driven back. Now... This isn't really the best example because Huskar probably could have turned around and killed the Spectre. But you get the gist of what I'm saying, right? These guys are very weak early on. They need the help of the supports. That's the point that we're trying to get across here. So we saw here some harassment by a support. That's not all that matters. Uh, it's great to harass. It's even better to recognize opportunities to get kills. Because kills are the best way to get your carry going. It's, it's like giving your carry a jump start. Basically, you know... If you want to get big, you can lift and, you know, eat right. Or you can take steroids. Think of getting kills for your carry as taking steroids, except without all the horrible side effects that they often come with. So let's take a look at how steroids can improve your play here. Okay, so we have our support here, the Venomancer. We have our Morphling, that's the hard carry. And then we have a hero that's very, very strong right now. It's a Viper. This is going to be, uh, this is going to be a level, I think it's level 6 or 7 Viper. Actually, it might be level 5. And then we have an, a bit lower level Morphling and Venomancer. These two heroes generally won't be soloing, so they're going to fall behind in the levels early on. So again, Viper, the big scary guy early on. This guy, not so good at dealing with a 1v1. But look what happens when the support joins the fight. So they start duking it out. You're going to watch the Morphling's health, health drop a lot more rapidly. He really can't win this fight 101. But then the Venomancer comes in and throws out a, a Venomous Gale, which slows and does damage over time. So now we see Viper. He can't fight this. He has to run. There's a waveform in. Now Viper turns and tries to fight. He's getting the Morphling very, very low. But Morphling uses really a ridiculous ability called Morph. 
which turns his agility into strength, which means he gets more health. He's able to survive, he gets the first blood. If this Venomancer isn't there, if he's not helping out, the Morphling's dead. But thanks to the Venomancer, they recognize an opportunity to get a kill, and they secure it. So we've talked about how supports can babysit, how they can help set up kills for carries early on. Uh, but they even they can make a big difference even later in the game. Uh, and sometimes the contributions the support makes... This is a game that's all about fighting, about killing creeps, about killing towers. It's a very violent game if you really get right down to it. And Well, there's some kind of gory effects. Uh, but sometimes the biggest contributions the support makes, they don't actually have to participate in a fight. The biggest way that they can contribute is by providing vision and scouting information to the team. Timely wards, which are an item that give your team vision in an area where you otherwise would not have it, or using your abilities to scout. There are some abilities that give vision. That can set up ganks or kills, or save your team from very big mistakes. So let's go through an example of that right now. Hmm. I think I'm missing this example. Ah, I think I skipped over one, but we'll go back to the other one that I'm skipping now. Okay, so for anyone who's not familiar with what's going on, if you've played League of Legends, this is... What is the name? I think it's Bait. Oh, this is that big guy that you want to kill that gives you a bunch of buffs in League of Legends. God, I should know. Baron. Oh, it's the Baron. That's the name of it. Uh, in, in Heroes of New Earth, it's, uh, it's Congor. And in Dota, we call it Roshan. It's a very important objective that both teams are going to have their eyes on. Uh, this is a situation where our sniper here, this guy, very, very squishy. If he just charges in, he's going to die. And so it's up to the support to give him vision and to keep him safe. So watch what this support does. It's a bad situation, but Vengeful Spirit is going to scout it out and keep him safe. Roshan's about to die. You can't see it. You can't really, this, again, it's not a perfect example because you can't see only this team's vision, but they get vision from that ability, which was just use the Wave of Terror. So they see what's going on, and they're able to run away in time. If they didn't do that, they would have died. Uh, so again, the support giving vision, keeping the team alive. That's the power of a support. Sometimes they can contribute without actually getting kills or doing damage. Okay, so, well, we've talked a lot about supports. Let's go ahead and talk about the final category. And the final category is the semi-carry or the ganker. This is our last hero role. Again, these are just big... Big picture kind of roles to sort of you know, try and wrap your brain around it. Get a general understanding of how heroes are grouped. They're not you know, hard and fast, uh, set in stone kind of thing. Uh, but our last category is the semi-carries. So the semi-carry, as you might expect, is, they're not quite a carry. They don't benefit as much from items. They sort of straddle that fence in between a support and a carry. Uh, they're heroes that can really benefit uh, from items, but they're not going to benefit as much from a carry. At the same time, they don't need them as much. They can get going earlier, so they straddle that fence. They're heroes that really need to have a big impact on the game. It's usually the semi-carry's role to turn the tides, to gain an advantage, uh, to pull the team back from a deficit. Normally, the heroes that are going to make the biggest impact in a game are the semi-carries, especially in that early to mid-game stage. They tend to be the flashier ones, so if you like action, if you like killing, if you like excitement, the semi-carries are going to be your heroes. Your job as a semi-carry is to disrupt the enemy team. You want, to, you want to stop them from farming. You don't want to let them level safely. You don't want to let them get creeps. You don't want to let them get gold. So in that re respect, you're very much like a support. The difference is you can't do it from level 1. I showed you how a support at level 3 can send a carry hero pretty much back to the fountain, back to base, take away all their health. That's not quite possible for a semi-carry. Even if it is possible, it's not what you want to do. Generally what you want to do is spend the first 5, 10, Maybe even 50 minutes, depending on the hero and the game situation. Being selfish. Get some levels. Get some farm. Get your hero into a better position. Then, once you're at that point, that's where you start to play like a support does from the word go. That's when you get really active on the map. That's when you start setting up kills, pushing down towers, being aggressive. Uh, and I mentioned a couple of ways to gain an advantage. Getting kills and getting towers. So let's go over some examples of that. Okay, so what you're going to see right here, right here is an example of how a semi-carry in this invoker can get set up a kill for the team with the help of a support hero. So we have a support, the, the Shadow Demon here, we saw him earlier, as well as a Windrunner who's a semi-carry for the opposing team. And these two are going to start to duke it out, and that invoker, the semi-carry, is going to step in and secure a kill. Uh, we're going to see how much damage he can do. So these two are on the same team, they're going for a kill here. 
So we're going to see the Shadow Demon. It's, it actually gets initiated on. Just, you know, use your imagination for this. He's going to turn around and use a sha Disruption and Soul Catcher. The same combo we saw earlier with the Spectre, the very squishy uh, black support hero. Disruption, Soul Catcher. The Soul Catcher is going to make every auto attack, every damage source do extra damage. And Invoker now is using Sunstrike. That's this thing that you see flying down. It's a lot of damage. It's a globe. You can actually use this globally anywhere on the map you can target, and it'll fly down and, well, incinerate whatever it hits. So uh, we're going to see that hit right on top of Windrunner. And in case you didn't catch it there, look at what happens to her health. <laughs> so you can see the power of the semi carry. Some semi carries are designed to just get those kills right away. And the Invoker, especially if you go for this Exhort build, if you go for Sunstrike, one of the semi-carries that can do it. So that's one way to help your team as a semi-carry, is get kills. Getting kills is one way to get ahead, but there's another way, an equally important way, and that's to get towers. So let's go over an example of a, of a semi-carry getting a tower. This is probably the least exciting of the examples. This is a hero called Lashrak. He has an ability that does damage to towers very quickly called Diabolic Edict. And you're going to see the tower just melt. When the tower dies, Lashrat gets a bunch of gold, and so does his team. So he's giving his team an advantage. He's putting pressure on the enemy, he's seizing an advantage for the team, and he's changing the tides of the game. That's the semi-carry's role. Again, if we go back to uh, our beautiful little picture here. The semi-carry's job is to be that giant figure that you see and tip the scales for the team. That's the semi-carry's role. Just like the carries, though. The semi-carries, there's all different stripes and flavors. There's some semi-carries that get off, get off to a really hot start and can be very active with a, only a few levels and a few items. There are some that can go much later into the game that are more like a carry. So again, it is very much a spectrum, and we're going to see that right now. Uh, and these are our final two examples of the day, so I hope you guys are enjoying them. Uh, here we go. This is a Pudge. This is... I call him a semi-carry. A lot of people would say he's a ganker or a hero killer. Uh, again, I'm trying to keep it simple for you, but Pudge, a hero that does a lot of damage with very few items, and frankly, if you're a new player, this guy's going to drive you crazy. There's going to be a few days where you're like, fuck Pudge, I don't want to play against that guy. He doesn't make my life very fun. But once you understand how he works, I promise you it'll get easier. But we'll see. This is a carry hero that he's trying to kill. He's trying to slow down the anti-mage, the hero that'll be a threat later on. Let's see how quickly he can bring him down. So Pudge is hiding in the trees, anti-mage doesn't see him. He throws out a hook, instantly look at the health. He goes from full to less than half. And now he's going to rot, which does damage in an area around him. And now he's going to dismember him, which holds him in place, locks him down. And you're going to see the anti-mage die here. So that's Pudge. He's only level 7, he barely has any items. He's a hero that can get these kinds of kills very early on. That's one kind of semi-carry. Let's look at another. And this case is going to be the Queen of Pain. Queen of Pain, on the sort of the flip side of the Pudge, she's a semi-carry that takes a little longer to get going. Uh, she also scales better into the late game than a Pudge. She offers your team more. But she's not quite as good at getting those kills early on, and we're going to see just why now. So, Anti-Mage sort of playing dumb here. Uh, and actually this, you know, you might say, oh, that's not realistic. Well, guess what? That plays into the example, plays into the point. This anti-mage is AFK. You know, he's jerking off, he's having a drink. Whatever he's doing, he's not paying any attention. Uh, and then he takes a bunch of damage. Queen of Pain used her ultimate. It's got over a two-minute cooldown. She drops him down to half. This is the same level anti-mage, the same item anti-mage, the same damn hero. She's used everything. Look at her abilities. All four on cooldown right now. He's at half health. And guess what Anti-Mage does? The saddest thing you're ever going to see to pub. He blinks away. This will not be the last time you guys see this. I promise you that. Whether you're a pro or a total noob. But, uh, so again, there are, two, there are many different stripes. I'm only giving you a few examples just to give you an idea. It's a big spectrum for all of them. Some semi-carries get going earlier, don't scale as well. Some are really strong early and continue to be strong. Some of them take a little longer to get going than the really strong late. For all of these categories, there are spectrums, there are different flavors. Uh, so, okay, so with all this being said, I've talked about the three categories. Let's just look at uh, a couple a couple of specific examples, just sort of give you guys uh, some of the more common carries, semi carry supports that you're going to see. Again, these are not comprehensive. Uh, there is some crossover here and there, but just to give you an idea. So for the carries, we have Morphling, Anti-Mage, Spectre, 
Outworld Destroyer, formerly known as Obsidian Destroyer. I gotta say, I like Obsidian better, but, you know, that's just me. Phantom Assassin. These are all hard carries. These are heroes that really scale well with items, need a lot of items to be effective. Then you have your semi-carries. Marana, Windrunner, Nightstalker, Invoker, and Queen of Pain. Heroes that can benefit from the items, but get going earlier. Don't need as much. Can be active on the map earlier in the game. Then we have our supports, and that's the last category. The Crystal Maiden, the Shadow Demon, the Vengeful Spirit, the Witch Doctor, and the Lich. Heroes that really don't need any items. If, if you get them, that's great. You want basic items, you know, you want boots so you move a little bit faster on the map. You want something to help keep you alive. Maybe a magic wand to help you regen. Uh, so you don't have to go back to the fountain to heal as much, so you don't die. But they don't need a whole lot of items or levels to be effective. Definitely not as much as these two. So that's examples of the three different categories. I've touched on this before. Uh, I have a graphical illustration of it. You guys are probably, you're probably not wondering because I spoiled this one, but are hero rolls really this black and white LD? Is it really this simple? <laughs> no, it's not. Actually, my webcam is blocking that. No, you silly goose. That would be too easy. Again, it's a spectrum, guys. It's a spectrum. So, uh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, again, it's all shades of gray. And I mentioned how I'm kind of simplified it. I'm giving you three categories. A lot of people would say it's not really that simple. There's not just your carries, your semi-carries, and your supports. There's a lot of other flavors and varieties, such as junglers, pushers, team fight specialists, initiators, anti-carries, healers, survival specialists. Um, you know, some of these some people would say are not categories. So again, there's a lot of debate in the Dota community. There's a lot of different theories and ways to look at it. But the point is, if you want to keep things simple, this is a good way to sort of split up the heroes and to think about them. All right, so you guys are probably wondering, well, when do we get to the part where we talk about how to select a hero? This was necessary background information. You can't select heroes unless you understand hero roles. It's, it is a prerequisite, and that's why we focused on it to start. Okay. So let's talk about some considerations when you're selecting a hero. You want a balanced team. So we have two different kinds of diets here. We have the pizza, beer, wings, the college diet. I'm sure some of us in the chat may have engaged in that in the past. Then we have our, uh, you know, our variety of uh, you know, meats and vegetables and bread here. Two different kinds of diets, uh, sort of symbolizing the different kinds of teams you can build. Generally, you want a balanced team. You don't want to have all of one. You don't want to eat just three different foods. You don't want to have just one or two different kinds of heroes on your team. You want a variety. You want a balance. So we're gonna show, I'm going to show here, and you know, if you haven't played Dota before, let's see how good your photographic memory is. Out of these three, which one looks the most balanced to y'all? If it's this one, if you think this is the balanced one, type 1 in the chat. If you think this is the balanced one, type 2. If you think this one is the most balanced, type 3. And uh, I'm very curious to see how y'all do. This is your first quiz of the day. I see some I see some ones, I see some threes, I see a lot of twos, I see a five, uh, 13, 37. All right, I, guys, I know for a lot of you this might seem obvious. Uh, again, this is designed to sort of help out those very new players, uh, and I'm trying to keep it very basic. That's right, it is number one. We have our, our hard carry in the anti-mage, we have our hard supports. I probably shouldn't say hard for both. We have our supports here in the Lich, as well as the Shadow Demon. And then we have our semi-carries, our gankers, and the Night Stalker, the Windrunner. This line up here, this is all hard carries. This is all heroes that need a lot of items, a lot of farm. Don't do anything for your team in the early stages of the game. And again, these are all supports. Crystal Maiden, Lich, Witch Doctor, Vengeful Spirit, Shadow Demon. So it's not one, it's not three, and it's most certainly not five, guys, you trolls. It is number two. So you want to pick a balanced team. That's the first point here. And let's talk about making that balanced team. All right, this is this, is, this should be incredibly easy, guys. You solo queue, your allies select two supports and two carries. What do you pick? One, a, se a carry hero. Two, a semi-carry hero. Three, a support hero. <laughs> oh, well, no, <laughs> no, I spoiled it. All right, whatever. That was the most, that was the easiest question in the world. Uh, it's a semi-carry hero, duh. <laughs> you want to keep a balanced lineup. Uh, you don't want to have three supports. You don't want to have three carries. You want to try and get a mix, at least one of each type. <laughs> All right, so let's do one that's a little bit more sort of challenging and interesting. Uh, so I talked about creating a balanced team here. 
And a corollary to that, something else that sort of goes along with it, another point to consider, you don't just want to build a balanced team, you also want to pick a hero that helps complement your team. Uh, so it's not about blindly like, oh, okay, we need a semi-carry, I'm just going to, you know, sort of pin the tail on the donkey. Uh, it's a little bit more... <laughs> it's a little bit more, uh, you know, sort of subtle than that. In this case, you know you're going to lane with a certain hero. Pick a hero that's going to complement him. So let's talk about an example of that. You're going to be laning with your friend. You know you'll need a strong dual lane to make up for your team because you know they're all idiots or they're drunk or whatever the case might be. He selects Sand King immediately. Who do you pick to complement him? Sand King, for anyone who doesn't know, is a melee hero. He's a strength hero. Uh, he's a hero that's an initiator. Uh, he's a hero that scales with items. I'd sort of throw him in that semi-carry department, but he's not going to scale super well. He's not a hard carry. So he's sort of a semi-carry, and you're going to be laning together with one of these three. Do you go with a Riki, who's a melee, who's a carry? Do you go with a Juggernaut, who's a melee and a carry? Do you go with Lina, who's a ranged hero, who's a support? Out of these three, who would you choose? Type 1 if you think Riki, type 2 if you think Juggernaut, and 3 if you think Lina. Obviously 1. 3 for the combo. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. 3, 3, 3. No, I don't think the noobs know the names. That's why I'm explaining them. I see a lot of ones. I see a lot of trolls in the chat. <laughs> the answer is the Lina. Uh, and this is, you know, this gets a little bit more into some details, but... Uh, Lina has a great stun, but it's difficult to set up. Sand Kid is a hero that can set that up. The other thing to consider here is that Lina's a ranged hero. You generally don't want to put two melee heroes together. You want to complement the melee hero with a ranged hero. So that should have been the giveaway, is the fact that Lina's ranged. That's why I tried to drop that little nugget of wisdom. Uh, but they're also a very scary combo in lane because you have the melee, the melee hero who's got a great reliable stun in the Sand King, who has Burrow Strike. And then you have Lina, who has a hard-to-hit stun that's very good if you can land it in her Light Strike Array. So that combo, very potent. And again, it's about picking a hero that complements your team. Sort of falling in with that idea of p p pick a balanced team, but pick a hero that's going to fit in well with what your team teammates have already selected. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I looked for counter pick. I searched on Google Images, and this was the first thing I found, actually. Uh, <laughs> I found the train hitting a, a car, and... It's kind of a horrible thing, actually, the more you think about it. I'm feeling kind of bad now, but uh, I guess trades are a natural counter to cars. So <laughs> counter the opposition is the point here. Lita is a hero that... Uh, I, and I'll, I'll take the question here. Sorry if I'm not answering all the questions, but I'll just sort of answer them here and there. Uh, Lita is generally a support. She scales okay with items, but not great. So she's not a hard carry. You could sort of say she's a semi-carry. She has one skill that gives her that potential. But for the most part, she's a support, and it's very difficult to live on, to survive on her, which, if you're not survivable, generally you're not the best candidate to be a semi-carry. Okay, so, second point here. You pick a lineup, pick a lineup that, you know, builds a nice composition for your team, uh, that complements your team, that's balanced. But also counter your opponents. If they pick something that can be countered, that's another consideration. You want to try and counter that. So they pick a lineup consisting of Riki, Bounty Hunter, Weaver, Triant Protector, and Phantom Lancer. For anyone who doesn't know, these are all heroes that go invisible. Which hero best counters their lineup? Sniper? A ranged carry hero that doesn't see invisible heroes. Earthshaker? A melee initiator that doesn't have any way to reveal invisible heroes. Or Slardar? A guy that can reveal invisible heroes with his ultimate. One, two, or three. Type it in the chat. <laughs> I'm keeping the examples basic, guys. He has counters anything. That's true. Pick Tide and carry a gem. That's an option. Four. <laughs> see some trolls in the chat today. No cute girls. This is a very straightforward... Kind of, it's, not, it's actually not that unrealistic. You will see teams pick a bunch of invisible heroes. Uh, and in this case, the answer is Slardar. He's a hero that can counter them. Uh, and I know I'm kind of dumbing them down a little bit and giving away the answers, but hey guys, it's supposed to be a learning exercise. Uh, there's no prizes, there's no quiz grades or anything like that. This is all about educating, so. Uh, it is the Slardar, because he can reveal the invis, and a lot of the strength of an invisible hero comes from not being seen, comes from being able to escape that way. Okay, so we're going to go with our final question here. The enemy team picks a heavy pushing lineup, consisting of Chen, Shadow Priest, Undying, Necrolay, and Earthshaker. Which hero best counters their lineup? First you have Ancient Apparition. 
well, let's this for this one. I'm not going to tell you anything about the heroes. Let's see how familiar y'all are with them. Uh, we have our ancient apparition, our life steal, and our wind runner. It's a heavy pushy lineup. What's the best way to counter them? I see a couple of ones. I see a, a one third, a three, a one three, a three, a one slash three, one or three, a two. Okay, guys, this one was kind of tricky, and I'm I'm impressed. I'm actually I'm very impressed. A couple of you guys are on the ball today. It is in fact one and three. Now, I will say I consider H apparition a slightly harder counter to this lineup. For anyone who's not familiar with these heroes, it's four heroes that have healing abilities: the Necrolite, the Undying, the Shadow Priest, and the Chen. H apparition has an ultimate that prevents you from using heals. If you try and heal, it doesn't do anything. So in that sense, he's the hard counter. But this is a heavy pushing lineup, and Windrunner is very good at stopping pushes with her power shot. So this is a case where there's one here that might be the best answer, uh, depending on your lineup, but it's not the only answer, and that's really the point here. It's, there's not only one right answer in every game. There are multiple heroes that can fulfill your needs. There might be one best hero, but there are many that can work. And so you shouldn't feel obligated to pick the right hero. You should pick a hero that you want to play, that you're comfortable with, just try and sort of follow the guidelines. Try and counter the enemy lineup as best as possible. But don't, don't be beholden to it. That's really the goal. Okay, so I've talked a lot about picking a balanced lineup, pick, co picking heroes that complement your team, and then trying to counter the opponent. Sort of, you know, two or three main points here. The final consideration is to really focus on the laning phase. The laning phase is the start of the game. If you've never played Dota before, your laning phase is going to be the first few moments after you pick a hero and you get into the game and start going. You have to focus on the laning phase because if you have a bad start, you may not be able to come back from it. So you always want to make sure that you're going to have a good laning phase. Or if, they, if you're not, that you're getting something exceptional in return. So our first example here, uh, I guess to put it another way, a good laning phase will often make a game for your team help win your, a game for your team. A bad one might break it. Just, you know, chop it up. So, I hope that's not an obscene gesture in many countries. <laughs> but, uh, okay, here's our first example. So, the enemy picks Pudge and heads mid. Uh, if you've played Dota before, Pudge is a very scary hero, especially for new players. Uh, <laughs> so, what do you do? What to do, in the words of Sing Sing? Uh, and I'm not going to show the, the answer yet. What do you guys think? Pick AMS for mid. Pick Nakes, easy. Pick Invoker five times. Quit. Ward runes, ward jungle always. Uh, as far as other things to do in game, that's great. But I'm only interested in what do you pick? AM, Bloodseeker, Juggernaut, Undying, OD. Okay. A lot of great answers here. I'm only going to show you one. And I can't talk about all of the examples because we never get out of here and we never move on. But a lot of you guys gave great answers. But I'm just going to give you one example, and I saw it earlier. Go mid with Queen of Pain. And I, it's, if it's not the easiest hero to lay against Pudge, it's one of the easiest. Pudge is a hero that relies on pulling you with his hook, and then running next to you and doing damage to you, and using his ult to disable you. He's got one way to pull you in. That's it. Queen of Pain is a hero that has an escape mechanism in a blink. So if Pudge pulls you in, well, you just blink away, and then you're fine. So... If Pudge ever does hook you, you can almost always escape. So you have a safety net. The other thing is that Pudge is a melee hero, and he can be harassed, especially by a ranged hero. Queen of Pain, if you haven't played her before, one of the best harassing heroes in the game, thanks to her Shadow Strike. So, to me, this is one of the best answers. Again, not the only one. Juggernaut, a great answer, because if Pudge is rotting, well, that's magical damage. If you use Blade Fury, you're not going to take it, and you do a, a metric ton of damage back to him. So Juggernaut, a great answer. Sanke with Caustic Finale, a great counter to any melee hero, generally speaking, in the 1v1 situation. Invoker as well, a really strong hero versus melee. So a lot of those answers were definitely great responses. The point here isn't, oh, you have to pick Queen of Pain if it's a Pudge. The point is, pick a hero that can win the lane. Pick a hero that you think can at least hold its own in the lane. And if you're going to pick one that can't, you would better have a good damn reason for doing so, because otherwise, well, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So that's example one. So your ally goes bot with Crystal Maiden. How can you get early kills? Let's say you just want to get kills. What's a hero that would go well with Crystal Maiden? Ursa. 
Pusher. Oh no, that's Juggernaut. CK. A lot of juggers here. Wisp. <laughs> AM. Sand Cane, Phantom Assassin, Alchemist, Lycan, Techies. Some trolls in the chat, uh, but there was one answer that a lot of people were saying, and that is the Juggernaut. These two, especially in the pub games, they love each other. Let's just face it. They should just, you know, like, you know, they'll sort of fight with each other and pretend they don't love each other. But when you get right down to it, Juggernaut and CM are match made in heaven. I mean, aside from the fact that he looks like a serial killer and, well, yeah, he's a creep. But these two are a perfect pair together. And that's why we have our heart. Uh, the reason for this is, well, first of all, Juggernaut's are here that get needs farm, benefits from it. Crystal Maiden is one that doesn't. So in that respect, they're not going to be fighting over the farm. You have one hero who needs it, one who doesn't. The other nice benefit here is you have one melee, you have one range. That's always a good thing to have. If you can have two range, it can be even better. But if you, if you have at least one range, you're generally going to be okay. On top of that, and this is really the important thing, Crystal Maiden has two disables. She's a big, long-range AoE slow. And then she's got a, a, an ability called Frostbite that holds heroes in place. So with those two disables... It's a lot of ways for Juggernaut to get into range to use Blade Fury. And Blade Fury is an AoE damage spell uh, that does a ton of damage. But the problem is sometimes you can't get in range to use it. Crystal Maiden gives you that option. She sets you up perfectly. Uh, and so again, if you want to get those early kills, this is a great combo to go with. So another example uh, of a hero that folk you can uh, sort of combine. And uh, if you're focusing on the laning phase, it's a great combination to have. All right, so I've already been pseudo quizzing you guys a lot. I'm not going to give you any help here. It's a common pub situation. Uh, let's face it, something we've all seen before, especially if you're a new player. Your team immediately slams down, not one, not two. Uh, actually, my fingers aren't showing up on the camera. I'm going to have to fix that for next time. Not two, not three, but four melee hard carries. Heroes that need a lot of farm that aren't good without it, or at least not really good without it. Juggernaut, Faceless Void, Spectre, and Anti-Mage. What do you pick, and why? And you, you say it's an odd question. Uh, who actually said that? Oh, whoops. Diablo Jamber? Diablo Jamber? You say it's an odd question, but let me tell you, this happens all the time, especially in lower level pub game. For whatever reason, new players just love to pick those hard carries. Uh, probably because they lose to them a lot. And, oh, you know, well, that hero's really good if he gets items, so I wouldn't have items. Okay, so what do you do in this situation? I'm seeing fifth carry. That's one option. Lich, Witch Doctor, range supports. Uh, here with a great ultimate. Morphling, another hard carry. Skeleton King, Axe. Lich, greater than all. A character between support and semi-carry. I vote Lashrak. A lot of good answers here. The one thing I will say, you probably should not pick another hard carry. You know, we talked about building a balanced team. You shouldn't eat exclusively pizza for 10 weeks. You might want to have at least one other food. Maybe put some, you know, tomatoes or broccoli on top of that pizza. <laughs> okay, so that would... Pr now, with that being said, you know, I, I know where a lot of people are coming from with that. It's, well, you can't trust these people if they're going to pick these kinds of heroes. Clearly, they don't know what they're doing. So I should just pick a hard carry. They can't be trusted. I'm going to shoulder that responsibility. <laughs> but with that being said... If you really want to win, if you, if you just want to get better as a player, you should know how to play every role. You shouldn't just be able to play one role. And on top of that, frankly, as good of a carry player as you might be, you need that support, and you're not going to have it from these heroes. So I would say the, hard, the melee hard carry, the one thing you really don't want to pick. <laughs> a couple of good responses, and we saw a lot of them. Uh, pick a dominant semi-carry or a ganker and go mid. Heroes like Queen of Pain, Invoker, Windrunner. I saw Night Stalker in there. Uh, these sorts of heroes that can win their lane and then spread their success to other lanes. Uh, another good response, pick a strong support hero. Sure, we have three carries who aren't going to have a good time, but I can help one of those carries have a good time. I can try, at least try and get one of them going, and then maybe he can help sort of shoulder the load, get the team into a later stage of the game. Heroes like Crystal Maiden, Venomancer, Shadow Demon. At the very least, you have four melee heroes. Four, four, there we go. Four melee heroes. Pick a ranged hero, for Christ's sake. At least pick one ranged hero, no matter what. At least pick a ranged hero, just to give your team a little diversity. Uh, if you have melee heroes, they tend to clump up. Uh, they tend to sort of block each other. Uh, they're not as good at dealing damage over the course of a fight. Even if they have a mobility skill, uh, again, they're very clunky compared to ranged heroes. So you want to at least get one. Uh, you should. 
Uh, I've cast one game, one pro game, where five melee heroes worked out. But let me just say that was a special circumstance, and generally it's not going to be effective. Okay. One more apply your knowledge. Your Radiant teammates pick a relatively decent lineup. Night Stalker goes mid. Windrunner is offlaning up top. Uh, and if you don't know what offlaning is, uh, feel free to hide around and ask me after the chat. I'd be happy to explain it to you. Uh, and again, you're on the Radiant side. Enigma is jungling, and Crystal Maiden is going towards the bottom lane. Three questions. So I want to see three answers, ideally separated by commas. Who do you pick? Where do you lane? <laughs> I'm really bad at this. And why? Three, three answers I want from you guys. So who do you pick? Where do you lane? And why? Pick Lycan because there's no reason not to, but you didn't tell me where you lane. Dual mid with Pudge. Two gankers are better than one. Jesus, carry, and bottom. I'm picking hard carry and going bot. Anti-mage bot, hard carry. Pick Venge because she's a girl. Kunkka jungle, hard curry. Jug bot because you said so like two slides ago. Morph bot. Okay. A variety of answers, and I do appreciate the trolls and, you know, the sort of fake answers that keep things interesting. Uh, and make everyone work for their knowledge. <laughs> A couple, there's one bad answer, and that is to pick a hard support. It's not really an awful answer. A hard support, it, out of all the things to pick that you maybe don't want, not the worst thing in the world. Uh, but in this case, you have a Crystal Maiden. She doesn't really need the farm. She's not going to benefit from it. So if you put two heroes that don't benefit from farm in the same lane, then it's a bunch of gold that it's essentially dropping into your pocket. You might as well have a hole in the pocket. It's just going to come out the other side. So the hard support, like a Shadow Demon, a Venomancer Lich, probably the one thing you don't want. But all the other answers are great. I saw someone suggest a, well, a jungler not so much, because Crystal Maid's not really good at soloing a lane. Uh, but something like getting a hard carry, you can enjoy the easy farm. I, you know, someone was juggernaut, you already said that. Yeah, that would work great. Uh, a hero that can get, you know, has some early game killing power and can set up those kills and benefit from the farm. Uh, you know, something like a juggernaut, a morphling, an ursa. Uh, you know, even a hero that can't get kills, but just needs the farm. A phantom lancer, a specter, a faceless void. Some of these we talked about earlier. Crystal Maiden can get you that farm, she can keep you safe. She doesn't need it, so you might as well take it and not feel bad about it. And then once you get later in the game, you'll be able to help out your team. Uh, you could even pick a semi-carry or a ganker, something like a sand cane, a marana, a tiny. But the point is, the one thing you really don't want to pick is another hard support, because you don't need it, and it's a waste of farm. Okay, so, that's pretty much it, I think, for the... Yeah, there we go. Okay, that is it for the presentation part of this. And I'm going to make a few, f two random notes... First of all, I mentioned this before, if you want to have a rule of thumb to live by, try to avoid picking too many melee heroes and too many carries. Uh, if your team already has two of either, you probably don't want to pick any more. Uh, it's one of these things where, like I said, melee heroes tend to clump up together, they tend to run into each other, they're kind of clunky, uh, and that's why you want to avoid them. Uh, it's also difficult for them to get in and out of fights, they have to travel further to do damage. Uh, there are some exceptions, there are some very mobile melee heroes like Anti-Mage, Faceless Void. Uh, you know, heroes like that where maybe it's okay. But generally speaking, try to avoid too many melees and then try to avoid too many hard carries. Because the hard carries, again, they all need a lot of farm. They start very slow. And you don't want to group up too many of those on one team. It'd be like ordering one pizza. There's one pizza. That's all the creeps you can eat. And then you, you select two of the hungriest guys you've ever met. Maybe four or five of them. There's not going to be enough food. I mean, that's just that's the facts. So, you know, same idea here. Uh, try and pick the correct amount of heroes that need that food, that need that farm, uh, and don't overdo it. And my final point, which I'll make, is more of a psychological one. Never be afraid, afraid to try new heroes, even if it's a bad choice. I'm giving you this advice to sort of help you get better to understand what you should do if you want to win. Uh, and all, you know, all these guidelines they've given you, that's all great if you want to win, if you want to get better. You know, all these sorts of things. But if all you really care about is learning a new hero or having fun, you just want to play a new hero go for it. If people hate on you for that, if they flame you, screw them. Just screw them. Don't worry about them. Feel free to mute them by all means. The guide that, you know, this sort of overview and guide is recommending the balance picking, the counter picking, the smart picking, if you will. It's to help you improve and win games because a lot of players want to do that. It's not the only way to have fun. And you'll see a lot of, a lot of the popular streamers will have fun. They'll pick heroes that really they would be the first ones to admit they shouldn't. It's a bad pick. Uh, and that's okay. So, Keep all this in mind if you want to get better, if you want to fun, but don't feel beholden to it. Don't let pe a lot of people will flame you. Uh, cause, let's face it, Dota can be very welcoming, but it can also be a very hostile community. So, with all that being said, 
I've tried to, I haven't really done a great job of, you know, offering opportunities for questions until now, but this is your time. Any questions you have, uh, whether it's a specific one about the material, whether it's, uh, you know, about future episodes, about the format of the show, any questions you have, this is your opportunity. Uh, and I'm going to try and answer these one at a time. LD, before you go, who are you rooting for next patch? Techies. It's got to be techies, man. That's who I'm rooting for. Actually, how can I be happier than Day 9? I don't think I'm happier than Day 9. That, 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 that guy, have you ever, if you ever watched him already playing Kingdom of Reckoning, or Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, he has more fun doing random shit than anyone else I've ever met. And I have some friends who love random shit, so I wouldn't go that far. But I try to have fun here and there. I'm actually secretly miserable. <laughs> little news about me. Uh, why should someone solo the suicide lane instead of the safe lane? The reason you solo the suicide lane is to give someone else on your team the benefit of the safe lane. So let's say you have a hero like an anti-mage who, or a specter might even be better, who's very weak in lane control, who can't really do well. The suicide lane is a harder lane because your opponents, well, it's again, it's more of an advanced topic, but generally they're going to be able to pull the creeps. They're, you're going to have to travel farther away from your tower, farther away from safety, if you want to actually get farm and get levels. So I hear like anti-mage, I hear like specter, you give them the safe lane so they can have an easier time of it because they need that easier time and they benefit a lot from it. Uh, the other side, the, the flip side of it is there are some heroes that are really great at dealing with that hard lane, like Windrunner, uh, an Enigma, a Lone Druid. These are heroes that are very strong in that suicide lane, either because they have escape mechanisms or they have a way to keep the creeps at their tower. Lich would be another example of someone who can keep the creeps at his tower. Uh, and generally, this is something you see a lot in lower level pub games, but that is why you would do it. Are there any heroes in pubs you feel are worth directly counterpicking? Well, I mentioned invisible heroes. I think that's definitely one you would want to counterpick. Um, I, if you want to counter casters, a hero that I pick a lot uh, is Nightstalker because his silence is very powerful. Uh, his 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 uh, his nuke, got like Void, does a lot of damage around. He's great at picking off casters like Queen of Pain. Uh, heroes that are very escapable, like Anti Mage, he's good at shutting them down. So uh, you know, if you're up against blinkers, mobile heroes, I I really like Night Stalker to help deal with them. Can I keep bullet points of what I say on screen? Uh, yeah, it's something. If you have any feedback, guys, don't put it in the chat, please. Post on my Facebook, which is facebook.com slash LDDota. If you're not already following me, if you're planning on tuning in again, that is the place to go to make sure that you can find out when the next show is. It, sh it will be probably the same time next week, although there have been some requests to start earlier so the European crowd can actually watch the whole show. So that's something we're considering. But for now, it'll probably be the 10 p.m. Eastern time uh, next Monday for Dota 101. Uh, so if you have any feedback, please post on my Facebook. You can private message me. Uh, and that way I'll have a record of it because this chat, I can't really save it very easily. More pizza analogies. I'm all tapped out, man. I'm sorry. It's called fog because it obscures what you want to see. Just like fog does in real life. What category is techies? Carry or extremely hard carry? Techies is a pushing hero and a semi-carry. He's not a hard carry. A hard carry is just, it's again, it's, it goes back to the spectrum. A hard carry is, is the kind of hero, like, they benefit the most from those items. They benefit the most from that farm. They need it the most. They're the weakest without it. That's your hard carry. I, you don't really hear the term too often, but if you want to talk about a soft carry, someone like a Juggernaut, um, who would be another good example off the top of my head, maybe a Viper, a Huskar, these sorts of heroes. Those are more of your soft carries. Heroes, they, they get those benefits from items, and they need the levels on the farm, but they don't benefit as much. And again, it, it, it all goes back to this idea that there are different gradients and stripes. Uh, you might have 20 zebras, but they all have a different pattern. The three categories again. Uh, yeah, let me go through them one more time. Where is it? Ah, there we go. No, that's not what I want. From current slide. Okay, perfect. Okay, these are the three main categorizations. Supports. They're, they they have the least need for items, the least need for levels. They're the strongest without them. They're the strongest early. They don't scale as well. That's your supports. Crystal Maiden, Shadow Demon, Vengeful Spirit, Witch Doctor, Lich. Generally, intelligence heroes tend to be supports, but not always. There are exceptions. So that's why I discourage you from thinking about, uh, you know, 
these roles purely based on what a hero's primary attribute is. Then you have your semi-carries. Heroes that benefit from items, they want farm, they want levels, but they only want some. It's sort of like, you know, if you want to use Goldie Goldilocks and Three Little Bears, you know how there's the one bear who needs, you know, uh, who needs the mo who has the biggest bowl of porridge and needs the most, then there's the one who needs just a, a, you know, a certain amount, and then there's the one who has the small bowl. Well, that's sort of what we're going with here. The supports, it's the bear that doesn't eat very much, just has a small little bowl. Then you have your semi carries. They have the medium-sized one. They need a certain amount. Uh, and then you have your heart. Uh, and so again, these heroes are Marana, Windrunner, Night Stalker, Invoker, and Queen of Pain. Uh, and then you have your hard carries, the heroes that need the most of that porridge. They need the most of those that farm, the levels. They take the longest to get going. But if you can get them, if you if for a given amount of farm and levels at a certain point in the game, the carries are going to take over. The Morphle and the Anti-Mage, the Spectre, the, the Outworld Destroyer, the Phantom Assassin. What's better for a noob such as myself for learning to play better and can't find someone to help teach? Bot matches or pubbing from Jarek Davis? I should actually cite you guys when I said ask a question. I was to address you directly. But yeah, Jarek Davis, uh, the best way in my, personally, this is what I believe, just dive in, man. Who cares? You might lose 20 games. Uh, I would say learn the very basics. Maybe play a couple of bot matches, but don't be one of these guys who just plays like 20, 30 bot matches. I have friends who played over 100 and still are not, you know, they're afraid to put their toe in the water. If you've ever played, if you ever frequent Team Liquid, there's this idea of ladder anxiety. Of people are just like afraid to compete because they're terrified of losing. They don't like the stress of it. Don't let Dota become that for you. This is a fun game. It should be a fun game. There are going to be people out there who are toxic, who make your experience negative. But I say get maybe a little background with the bots, do a little bit of reading. But the best way to learn is the experience, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Can players like heroes be on the spectrum from the illustrious Wayne's Big? Uh, yes, Wayne's Big. Players are also exist on a spectrum. My cat is my desktop background, White Lakes. Indeed she is. Who is my... F okay, do I... Will Let's see. Are there any other questions? What's your opinion on playing hyper hard carries hyper-aggressively Navi style? Uh, for anyone who's wondering, McNaught's Rock Rococo is asking... Uh, he's talking about Havost, and a, a great example would be the, the Anti-Mage, because when they pick Anti-Mage, a lot of times they get a Vanguard and a, a Vladimir's offering. Two items which are very effective early on, but don't scale as well into the late game. And I think it's a great style to play, but only if you know how to execute it. And uh, in a pub game, I think it's the safer way to go, honestly. You'll see people rush Battle Fury or even Hanna Midas on heroes like that. I think you're going to win more games if you go for those early items, because... Uh, you're going to make mistakes if you're not a, a great player, and even if you're a great player, you will. Uh, so getting those early items that help save you from mistakes, it's like having training wheels on your bike. Uh, you, you know, you're not going to fall over if you sort of lose your balance. You're just going to tilt a little bit to one side. And getting an item like a Vanguard of Vlad's, it's sort of like having those training wheels. Uh, but, you know, it can, it, unlike training wheels, it doesn't really slow you down. It just lets, gets you going earlier. What is the point of dropping? Oh. Mm, let me skip that one. Okay, guys, so I th think that's about to do it for the questions, at least for the official broadcast. <laughs> um, yeah, that is going to do it for the, the questions. I'll hide around, and you guys could definitely ask me questions, and I'll answer them. Uh, but for the official uh, the video for the VOD and for everyone who's not watching this live, that is going to do it. So... I just, before we end here today, I just want to say thank you to everyone who tuned in, whether you liked it, whether you hated it. Uh, I do appreciate you guys at least giving me a chance, and I would love to get your feedback. If you liked it, tell me what you like about it. If you hated it, let me know that too. Uh, and you can contact me on Facebook to do that. Uh, you can also, uh, really that's the best way. If you want, you can contact me on Twitter. It's facebook.com slash LDDota. It's twitter.com slash LDDota. Uh, and if you want, you can even message me on YouTube, which is youtube.com slash LDDota, or right here on Twitch twitch.tv slash LDDota. If you really want, you can email me at ld at LDDota.com. That's, that's where I would like to be contacted. If you leave feedback here, I'll try and read it, but the chat has been going pretty quickly. And uh, frankly, you know, it's, it's, I'm not having a chance to write things down right now. So I want to thank all you guys for coming out either way. If you have any requests for topics, uh, if there's something you want to see covered, if there's something you want me to go in more in depth about that I just touched on today or I mentioned, that's great too. If there's something I didn't talk about at all and you'd like to see that in future episodes, let me know that too. And again, you know, facebook.com slash LDDota, the best way to reach me. Uh, and if you did enjoy it by, you know, some miracle, if you want to follow me, if you want more content in the future, 
Uh, please show me some love, show me some support. Follow me on Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all those slash LD Dota. Uh, I also do some casting of professional games and pubbing here. I'll be casting at the International too, uh, and you'll have a lot more exposure to me then. Uh, and follow me on Facebook or Twitter, really the best way to make sure you don't miss out on whenever my stream goes live. I also want to give a big shout out to my mods, although they really didn't do anything today. But thank you guys for being here and helping to keep the chat in line. Uh, and of course, thanks to the DC staff, Black ID for making all these wonderful overlays, and then Lumi, uh, 15 Rogue, and Wicked for going over the content and providing feedback. So that does it for the broadcast. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, tune in tomorrow to Lumi. Uh, our, next, our next episode of the Dota Show will be him taking an in-depth look at advanced warding. It's going to be at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Pacific, same time as it was today on his channel, which is twitch.tv slash Luminous Inverse. So I hope you guys all enjoyed. Thank you very much for joining me, and I look forward to hearing your feedback. I look forward to bringing you more content in the future. Uh, my next episode, my next piece of content will be getting that ass Larry, which is a very hero-focused kind of thing uh, based on my own replays. That'll be on, on Wednesday this week, so not tomorrow, but the following day. So until next time, guys, that's going to do it. Thank you all for tuning in.